Hello, shalom to all of you and welcome to the table. If this is your first time um, coming to uh, Bread for the Journey, the online Bible study, uh, we, we again want to welcome you and let you know a little bit about what we're doing. We're reading um, the Bible all the way through with a group of believers from uh, wherever you are in the world. We're just coming online, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, time every Monday evening. Uh, we have a reading plan that you can find at tourofTruth.com or tourofTruth.org. Um, you can follow us there. You can also download the app from the website and follow along in the reading. And we come together on Monday nights to fellowship over the word, to discuss what we're reading. Um, this is participatory. So we do have uh, facilitators. I'm a facilitator. My name's Krista Smith. Um, there's also Pastor Sylvia, who'll be, who will be facilitating this evening, um, and Jed Robine and others. Others. Jed is not with us this tonight. He's actually in uh, Washington, D.C. He has an event, so he uh, said to send his blessings to everyone. He'll be back next Monday. He'll actually be hosting again next Monday. And so we have been in the book of Job. We went right from Genesis to the book of Job which is interesting because the next book in the Bible is Exodus, but we're doing a chronological reading plan. And this book of Job actually predates um, the Levitical law, and it also predates the nation of Israel. So we're, we're, we're tackling that book first, and then we will continue on in the story that we're watching unfold that started us in Genesis, um, which is laying out the characters and um, really setting us up for what God is about to do with Israel and we, how we see Israel fitting into God's plan for redemption from beginning to end, from the book of Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And so we're going to continue back as after we um, climb out of the book of Job. When we finish uh, this book, we'll be back in Exodus and start again back into our journey with Israel. But for now, we're bookmarked here in this incredible book. And I'm going to just set this up before I turn it over to Pastor Sylvia to just sort of... Um, you know, talk a moment about what Job, the book of Job is, uh, what it's pulling us into. You know, it really invites us to examine the basis of our faith in God. Job's um, loss of his possessions and his family members, the alienation of his friends, you know, it shook his faith, we see to its core, really shook this man. And it's such an example to us of suffering and how to even suffer well. He kept his faith through the whole thing by trusting in God. And he proved at, in the end that Satan's accusations were lies by keeping and holding on to his faith. And even in his complaints, because he did complain, you know, the Bible, you know, talks about being angry, you know, and it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, be angry, but do not sin. So we see that Job was complaining. He was upset. He was angry. Um, but Job acknowledged that only God could provide the answers that um, he needed. And that's what we see throughout. You know, sin does bring suffering, but Satan's accusation that suffering people must have sinned is not necessarily true. Um, and, and if you have your Bible, you might want to turn really quickly or write down Isaiah 54, 17, which says, but in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen to that. I mean, these are things that we can trust in and know that God is absolutely going to bring about justice. He is. He is a just God. And he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So even though we're walking through trials, the Lord is going to handle it, for, for, you know, where we have been falsely accused or where we have been um, dealing with things, uh, walking in trials um, where people maybe have poked and prodded at us along the way. The Lord, will, he sees, he sees all that's happening. And so I wanted to point out one other thing before Pastor Sylvia continues us through uh, the, the um, she'll start with a 15 minute overview as well before we get into some questions and discussion. But um, some people today actually 
do what we see Job's friends doing, you know, kind of blindly following them um, in equating godliness with blessing. But at its root, you know, this perspective, it expresses unbelief because it really refuses to realize that we must also share Christ's suffering. And the Bible says what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. So we're just not meant to know or understand everything. And that's part of what we see in the book of Job. One other scripture I want you to write down or turn to is Deuteronomy 29, 29. And it says, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. And I'm reading from an NLT translation. But it says, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. You know, the Lord does require, and he's looking for our obedience. He says, obedience is better than sacrifice. But back to Job, some things, you know, are for God alone. Let me turn my phone off. It's beeping. Some things are for God alone to comprehend and direct according to his sovereign will. And there was a purpose we see in Job's suffering and in all of this. And our response should be to accept in faith what he sends us to truly stand like Job did in faith. Even when we suffer, we can trust God. And I think that's what we're going to continue to see as a resonating theme within our uh, sharing and our time over this fellowship in the word tonight. And so I just want to invite the Lord to be with us um, before I, I ask Pastor Sylvia to lead us um, so, Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come together with the saints of God, Lord, with those that you have called by name, Lord, that you have invited into um, this time of fellowship. You've told us, Father, in your word, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves all the more as you see the day approaching. Lord, we know that a church is not the wall. It is not the building. It's not the brick and mortar. It is your people. Our bodies are the temple of your spirit. And where two or more are gathered, you are here in our midst. And so, Father, we invite you, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this fellowship, Lord. We come before you, Father, with pure hearts, Lord. We come before you ready to receive from your word, ready to receive from you, our counselor, the great I am that wants to fellowship with us, Lord. How awesome and wonderful is that? We are so delighted, Lord, to be in your presence. And we're so humble, Father, that you have invited us into your throne room of grace and asked us to come even boldly. So, Father, here we are. We ask you to teach us, lead us, guide us in this time. I pray for an anointing to come upon Pastor Sylvia, Lord, as she continues to impart your word. Father, we know that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish all that you have purposed for it. And so, Lord, we bless and magnify your holy name. We bless the name of the Lord. You are our King, the King of kings, Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty. And we just bless your name today, Father, and we just pray that you'll be with us and impart to us what you'd have for each one of us to receive from you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And so without further ado, Pastor Sylvia, if you uh, would give us your camera, that would be wonderful. And uh, we can all say hello and hear a little bit from Pastor Sylvia. Are you with us? I am, and my camera is on. Amen. Do you see me now? We see you now. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, I've been here listening. Thank you for that uh, wonderful um, introduction. And just saying to everyone, as always, it is truly a privilege and an honor to be among you. Amen. To be among those who love the Lord with all of their heart that are on this journey together that God has us on. Amen. So we're going to get started. And I believe, Krista, because I do have some slides I'd like to show as well. Amen. Glory be unto God. Again, as Krista said, we're going to be looking at the book of Job and the character of Job individually. 
understanding that this really is a message of hope, mercy, compassion, and healing. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember when I first began to read the Bible, and there were two different books that people cautioned me on. And they said, don't read the book of Job unless you are praying for patience. Because if you read that book, you're going to go through some things. And then the other one was the book of Revelation, because they did not understand that it was the revelation of Jesus. Christ. So in that, there was no reason for us to be afraid. Same way it is with the book of Job. Job is a book that gives us the message of hope. Who in God, his mercy, his compassion, and his healing power. Glory be unto God. Was Job a real person? Absolutely. There are many things that says because it is written uh, in a, a poetic form, literature, all of those things that is just a book that was written to inspire us and to bring us into poetry, but it's not. How do we know? Because in uh, the book of James and Ezekiel, it says indeed that, J uh, that Job is a individual. He's real. In particular, James 5, 11 through 16 specifically addresses Job. And then Ezekiel 14 and 14. And Ezekiel tells us that God is saying, even if the three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would only be able to save themselves by their righteousness. Glory be unto God. So we can see that we are indeed reading, hearing, and sharing in the story of the individual Job and his family. I want to uh, begin by by posing several questions up front that I want you to keep in your mind and think about as we continue on. And these are, why do the righteous suffer? We're gonna talk about this at the end. Does God do evil? Can Satan provoke God into doing anything evil? And is God like the mafia men? who send Satan as a hitman so he can keep his hands clean. Again, question, why do the righteous suffer? Does God do evil? Can Satan provoke God into doing anything evil? And is God like the mafia men who send Satan as a hitman so he can keep his hands clean? Here's a highlight for chapter one, and that is again, Job, where he's from. He was blameless, upright, feared God, and turned away from evil. I want you to open up your Bibles right now, and let's take a quick look at Genesis six and nine. Genesis chapter six and nine. In Genesis six and nine, God brings us to the story of Noah. But here's what I want you to see is in Genesis chapter six and nine, God makes a distinct observation in reference to Noah. And he says this, he says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. Do you notice that in Job, going back to Job, God says that he was blameless, he was upright, he feared God, but it does not say that he walked with God. So God is already telling us that he was straight, he was honest, he had integrity, but the walking with God Perhaps God is trying to get us to see that there is something else that we're not able to see right now. He was wealthy. He had seven sons, three daughters. His sons used to hold feasts at each other's homes for seven days and invite their sisters. In other words, they would party for seven days, drinking, having fun. Here's Job's response. 
When the feast days had run their course, Job would go and sanctify them. He would rise early in the early in the morning and he would offer burnt offerings according to the number of them. The number of them is his children. See, Job understood something and that was that his children's relationship with God wasn't where his was. And he also thought that if he could go in and offer these offerings unto God, then God would accept them. That sometimes is what we do because we, because of works, we think that if we do this, then it will be acceptable to God and then God is obligated to do A, B, C, and D. Job did this continuously. That's what the word tells us when we look at these scriptures. Job knew again that his children were not in the same standing as he was. When we continue on in chapter one, we see that on the day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came. The sons of God were talking about the angels and the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from coming to and from walking up and down on it. Now, quickly, let's look at 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 Peter 5 and 8. Here's what we need to understand is that Satan is not God. And therefore, he is not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. When we look at 1 Peter 5 and 8. First Peter five and eight is where we're going. First Peter five and eight, it says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeing whom he may devour. Again, God is giving us information to let us know that he is not omnipotent, Satan that is. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere all at the same time. He's walking to and from to see whom he can devour. That's his M.O. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. When we see that word considered, I want you to understand that that means to put your heart on, to put your mind on. So God is saying to Satan, I already, because God knows every thought before we think it. God knows everything that Satan is going to do before he does it. So God is saying unto him, I see that you have already put your mind, you have already decided or put your heart on Job. Then Satan answered the Lord, does, does, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and all he has on every side? Pay attention to that hedge, the hedge that is around him. We're going to come back to that in just a few minutes. But he goes on now. Satan is telling God, but stretch out your hand now. Touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, all that he has is in your hand against him. Why did God say that? Because God sees what you and I do not see. He knows what we do not know. Amen. Remember the hedge. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. Long story short, when he leaves the presence of the Lord, Job loses everything. He starts out with his material possessions, his wealth, then it comes to his family, and one person after another is coming to tell him about what has happened. He, in essence, loses everything, amen, except for his wife 
Amen. Because in the Hebrew, as well as it should be with us, they are one. So God knows that he needs to hold on to his wife. He also allows him to keep his friends. We will see that in a few minutes as well. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground. And what was his response to worship? At this point, Job is sitting in a garbage dump. He's sitting in a garbage pit. Now, I ask myself, and I wonder, did he do that on his own or because he came from where he was well-known, well-represented, did they send him out of the city and this is where he ended up? But he worshiped God. Job is showing us, and God wants us to see in the worst of the situations, in the worst circumstances, we are to worship him. There is a worship in the sorrow. There's a worship in the pain. There is a worship. Then Job goes on to say this very interesting thing. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we know that in doing this, we even know this quote is used oftentimes at funerals, so on and so forth. Hearing Job's response is a good thing. God heard it too. And he goes on to say this about Job. He said, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. He did not sin and he did not charge God with wrongdoing doing. Now, here's the thing. Oftentimes when things start out, we start out in one position. But as the struggle, because the struggle is real and things continue, we can lose sight. We can get confused and change things up. But Job was holding on. Praise be unto God. Now we see another day comes and the sons of God are presenting themselves before the Lord again. This is in chapter two. And again, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job again? Consider is a compound word that means set your heart on or put your heart on. Amen. He says, there's no one like him on the earth. Blameless. Blameless does not mean without fault. It doesn't mean without making a mistake, without error. It doesn't mean that he's perfect. It means, again, that he is straight, he is honest, he has integrity. And an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He persists in his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. When we look at the word incite, it means to prick, to seduce, to entice, to irritate me, to act. We continue on. Satan comes out of the Satan goes out of the presence of the Lord and inflicts some loathsome sores on Jacob, on Job, from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Why? Because when we were reading the scripture, we saw that Satan goes on to say unto the Lord, again, trying to get him to do something that is evil or something that's not right. He goes on to say that skin for skin, if you are afflict his body, then I know he will curse you and die. God wants us to understand that the enemy is tr always trying to get us to lose our faith, to lose our hope, to turn our hearts away from God and to believe that God is evil. God is mean and God is a terrible God. All of that is absolutely not true. He has sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's sitting in this, this garbage dump now, uh, you know, and his wife comes, the wife that he loves, and she says to him, do you persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. Do you notice that the very words that came out of her mouth is what Satan told God that Job would do if he 
took away his possession, his children, and if he inflicted his body. Here's what we need to understand. What God cannot get you to do, he may use someone that is closest to you, that you love the most, to try to bring out what he desires, which is the very worst. But he said to her, you speak as a fool, as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips yet. He did not call his wife a fool. He said she was speaking like them and he did not sin yet. Going into chapter three and a few highlights, what happens? Job's three friends come because they heard of his troubles that he come upon him. Each of them set out from their home. Now, what I find amazing here is that, remember, this is before the book of Exodus, which means that it was before Facebook. It was before Twitter. It is before cell phone. It's before all technology. But they hear and they come. Job had a relationship with them. And I would even ponder that they probably had like goals, like values, like belief, and like faith. But things changed. And why? Because now it hits home when it hits Job. You can see that his friends, Eliphaz, the Timnite, Bildad, the Shuite, Zophar, the Nimite, they met together to go so they could console him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. Why? Because Job was a, in my terms, he was a hot mess. They did not recognize him and they saw the severity of the situation. They sit with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him for they saw that his suffering was great. They saw when they arrived and they begin to mourn with him. And one of the Jewish customs, although the Bible does not tell us that he was Jewish or of Jewish descent. Why? Because God wanted us to understand that the story of Job is the story of any man, any person and what they could go through. But one of the things that the Jewish custom does is that if someone is in mourning, someone is grieving, those who come to visit, they don't say anything anything and the first person that will speak is the person that is in that mourning and in that grieving in this case it is job and while job was sitting i believe that his mind was at work and he began to think about all that he had done for god all that he had done for god which is sometimes what we do we be good to to think about and tell God all that we've done for him so we don't understand how we could be going through this. How is this fair? How is this right? All of that because we can see that something in Job changes. And after this, when Job opened his mouth, he cursed the day of his birth. Something had changed. And then when we get to verse 25, he says, truly the thing that I feared comes upon me. What I dread befalls me. Fear is the root. It is the branch. It is the root. It is the branch in God's hedge of protection and a ring of fire around Job. In other words, his fear was the root for the thing that would put a hole in the hedge of protection and the ring of fire around him. I'm going to ask you to look at Proverbs 25, write them down, 25 through 26, and 2 Timothy 1 and 7. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. Because of the shortness of time, because we really want you to be able to engage in this, I will tell you that in essence, in Proverbs, it tells us and it warns us that if we put a hole or a stone in the hedge, then we will then the individual that does so will be 
bitten by a snake. What is the thing that we know is one of the characteristics or the way that Satan is displayed in the scripture is the snake. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Timothy 1 and 7. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us one of power, love, and a sound mind. See, the hedge was now down. And in Ecclesiastes 10 and 8, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoever breaketh the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. And the, this is what we understand. It was due to Job's lack of knowledge. Job didn't have any scripture references that he could go to. He lived before Moses and the law. Prior to both the Old and the New Testament, he is it is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible. Amen. That's why we went from Genesis, came all the way to Job. And he did not know what he did not know. Job did not have what we have. We have the word of God. And God has it written so that we can read it. And we know that Fear, the only thing we should fear is God and not man or anyone else. Fear, he, his fear stemmed from this. Job knew his children and he knew his children's lifestyle. And because of that, there was an open door to give Satan legal ground in which to enter in. See, fear brings what you don't want. Fear has torment. But faith brings things you do want because without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Hebrews 11 and 6. Here's what I want to leave you with. And that is find hope in the book of Job. Don't look at the mess. Look at the mercy of God. See his compassion and great love. God delivers and heals Job from all his afflictions and gives him double for his trouble. Chapter 42. Now let's look through the lens of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, it says this. Indeed, we call blessed those who show endurance who have heard of the endurance of Job. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. James 5 and 11. In the book of Job, it even goes on to demonstrate this. Remember that after God shows up on the scene, has a conversation with showing Job about nature, the universe, making Job understand that only he he could do these things. Only he is God. Job began to see the error of his way and he went from accusing God to repenting. And in repenting, God forgives him and God goes on now to tell the three who came up against Job that they did not represent him well. And in order for them to be blessed now, Job needed to bless them. See, when we repent, God wipes away everything and then the blessings come. And the Job had to pray for them. So in James, uh, it goes on to tell us, and this is what we stand on, when we stand in right relationship with God, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The book of Job is a book of hope. It is the book of the Lord and his mercy and his grace. Glory be unto God. Amen. All right, when we started out, I had posed you. Let me stop sharing this so that I can come back to you. Amen. When we started out, I uh, laid before you, placed before you uh, four different questions. Amen. And what I want us to do at this time is now uh, address them. And the first one is, why do the righteous suffer?
Is it to bring glory to God? Amen. To bring glory to God. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Well, I wonder if it's because other people can see, like I have a girlfriend that's going through something and she's so beautiful in the way that she prays to the Lord. And she says over and over, I trust him. I trust him. My precious Jesus, I trust him. And she's going through something so hard. And it, it um, inspires me to watch her always say, I trust him, my precious Jesus, when things are falling apart in her life. That's what I see. Um, Amen. Amen. That it can inspire others and help them to see and know the relationship that you have with the Lord. Anyone else? Um, I believe they suffer so that they can be in position of standing in the gap for the sake of others in a time to come. Amen. So to stand in the gap for the sake of others. Amen. Now, when you say standing in the gap, give us a help us to understand what you mean. I'm like, sometimes if I'm to talk about faith, Previously, I would preach faith, but let me say if I would pledge something, I would be leaning, let me say on my parents or something to fulfill something. But if God takes you through an experience of faith, living without money, living without leaning on anybody's um, help or something, and then you literally have to lean on God alone, you put your faith fully on God. So there are moments when you you feel like you're suffering and you're like, is this what it means to love God? Does it mean that I must clock? Does it mean that I should express this kind of life or something? So the next time as you're standing in the gap for those that need faith, for those that are going through something, you are praying with not only knowledge, but you're praying with wisdom, understanding, and experience at the same time. Amen. Very good. Absolutely right. Because one thing that I know is you can't give someone what you don't have. Amen. Exactly. And if you have walked a mile in those shoes, it brings validity when someone comes to you and you're able to share with them. All the experience that I have, I realize that it's not for myself alone is for the ones that God is going to send so you can share that with them and they can see what he did for you, he will do for them as well. Anyone else? Come on, like to share. Yeah, we, um, you see, without faith, we are nothing. And no matter what we're going through, you know, it's just to hold on. You understand? To hold on. We suffer. Because God died on the cross for our sin. And, you know, he alone, you know, we, we, we go through a lot. And no matter what, you know, I have, like, sometimes, you know, a person might have one son and that son passed away. You understand? Mm. And, 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 but because she believed in God and no matter what, she hold on to, the, to God's faith and she not God lent him to her. You understand? And he, he take that son. Some will, will, um, will commit suicide or some will fret, go through depression because God take that son and they will give up on God. But no, you understand? We have to hold on. We have to suffer. You understand? Suffer. Um, just to know that there's a God because, listen, the devil is out there and the devil will tell us that there's no God. Look what you're going through. But, but we have to hold on. Hold on to faith, you know, and ride it out. You know, because we don't know when, we don't know how, but one day he's going to show his appearance. You understand? So we have to, we have to just continue to hold on to faith. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? I yes. see a hand up. Go right ahead. Arnetta. Oh, so I'll share. Okay. I'm sorry. Someone there? Oh, yes. Later, go. Right, yeah, Rachel, you can go right after she does. Go ahead, okay. Arnetta. 
I, for me, I was going to say it gives us firsthand experience with God because we can say God is a healer. Mm-hmm. We can easily testify to things that we've heard from other people that God is a healer and he'll make ways for you, you know, make ways and all of that. But when you've had a personal experience and you've experienced God's healing yourself, or when you've been in a, in a situation and he brought you through that, then you have a personal experience and you can testify to, to, to the glory of God and what he actually can and will do. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Rachel? Um, thank you. Uh, this question takes me back to James chapter 1, verse 2, when James tells us to consider it pure joy when we go through trials and, and, and tribulation, all kinds, all kinds of trials. And in three, he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces in, in perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So meaning that with this, what I understand is that when I go through a trial, and yes, in, in, in our in our vocabulary, we say we are suffering, but I believe it's a trial because suffering doesn't last forever and ever. Yes, sometimes the situations come in our lives and we feel like, oh, this whole year I've been going through only, only try, only suffering. But there is a light somewhere, somewhere a light comes up. Even it, the, the, the trials are for a specific time. And when you overcome those trials there is a victory there is a growth there is a maturity that you attain why because you've 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 overcome the trial the other analogy would be uh, looking at a teacher giving examinations to their students and you see the child scratching their head looking at the ceiling trying to look for answers and all that and the teacher looks at the child and at the end of the day the child excels and they are promoted to another level of their education level. So it's 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 for me it's it's the same thing as the trials that we go through. So why do Christians suffer? I believe it's a it's a time of trying, being tried, so that you 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 mature. And when you're done with that period of training, that period of trials, you become complete. And that, that's why we have a testimony. That's why. Some, someone can stand and encourage the other. Why? Because they went through that. So I believe it's for growth, it's for maturity. It's, yeah. Amen. Thanks, Rachel. Anyone else? And I was going to yes. say... Go uh, ahead. I was going to say, Sylvia, uh, it just reminds me of uh, John sixteen thirty three. I mean, we live in a fallen world and, and this is what we get in this world. Amen. Here's what Jesus said, which pretty much encompasses everything that was said in uh, Revelation 3 and 19. God uses suffering and trials to discipline us. Jesus said that he does discipline those he loves. Suffering, this is my words, that is, suffering deepens our spirit. It strengthens our resolve to keep our eyes on him and the path that he has put before us. Second question that you should have been pondering as we were going through is, does God do evil? Pastor Sylvia, can we hold that one second? Terrence yes. had his hand up as well. Oh, okay. Oh. Go ahead, Terrence. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Mama. No, for me... Um, I went to Romans chapter five, verse three. Um, that's three to uh, uh, four. Uh, that says that not only uh, so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character hope. I like that a lot because it speaks so much to the individual about the things that you feel. And if you just remain in faith, and stand firm and continue in the suffering, one thing is going to do is build very, very strong character. That character that never fails, always trusting God, knowing that no matter what, 
He is in everything. His hand is in everything. So that's what really blesses me, that suffering builds character. And I can say, coming from Africa, that I learned how to appreciate life because of the suffering that I went through coming to the United States. When I see some of the behavior and the character of young men who don't appreciate life in its fullness, I am a little perplexed and hurt, you know. Um, uh, but I, I appreciate life a lot more because of the suffering I've had to go through. And whatever I get today, uh, I, I, I thank the Lord and it, it brings about joy, you see. So there is a stark difference. So I, I cherish suffering for the main reason that it produces uh, good character in the person. And you learn Amen. how to appreciate a little bit more. Amen. Amen. And I believe that as we look at the book of Job, we can see that because Job exclaims and that he knew, he said, you know, I could speak. I heard about you. But after the suffering, he says, now I know. Now I know. So it is in the suffering that allows us to come to that place where we know that we know that we know that we know that he is the Lord, that he is God, that he is good. It's not just something that we heard about because sometimes we can express, you know, I have head knowledge, but I don't have heart knowledge. After the suffering, the hard knowledge comes in and no one can take that away from you. See, you can't tell me that God is not good. You can't tell me that God is not faithful because I know what I've been through. And he has demonstrated that and shown himself to be that over and over again. And every time I've suffered and come out of it, I've learn and got to know God in depth that I never knew before. Amen. Suffering takes us from surface Christianity because, you know, we have that. We say our Christian ease. How are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. What does that mean? Glory be unto God. Till that place where now I can tell you how I'm blessed. And I can tell you I'm highly favored. And it's not just two words. I can tell you that when I thought that all was said and done, when the enemy himself showed up to tell me all the reasons why I should commit suicide and die, God showed up to tell me all the reasons why I should live. Suffering does create character and depths of character in us. Anyone else before we move on to the next one? All right, I don't see any other hands. Then I'll go back to, can God do evil? I have my hand up. I've been having my hand up. Blessing here. Oh, okay. Well, blessing, you're uh, probably not on the page that I'm in. So next time, oh. send something in the chat. Amen. <laughs> but go right ahead. Yes. Um, why do the righteous suffer? Um, to me... There are a lot of people out there who are suffering, you know? A lot of people are going through even probably worse, worse situations than what we're going through. But because when we come to Christ, when we get adapted into this family, we get a tendency of thinking that um, it's all gonna be roses and ice cream, you know? But the word of God tells us that when we pass through the water, he will be with us. Even through the fire, you know, he's going to be with us. He does not say that we shall never go through the water and the fire, you know, but he says he promises to be with us, you know, and love is long suffering, you know. So when we, we go through hard situations, we are not like everybody else who is going through probably the similar situation. But we get to hold and hang on to this love, knowing that our God is faithful. Because I, for one, have been through situations where people who are going through even worse situations come and try to pull me down. Mm. are trying to prove to me that I'm going through a worse situation than they are. But the reality is they are way, way worse than I actually are doing. But because they're trying to, to show me that my God is not actually working. But because I know that he really, really loves me, 
You know, I ponder unto that. I hang unto, uh, unto that. So even if we are suffering, the righteous and the unrighteous are suffering, we hang unto the love of God. And by the time we are through whatever we are going on, be it, a, be it an illness, be it a financial situation, be it a relational challenge, we are stronger than we initially were when we were starting on that journey. Even our relationship with God is stronger because we, we get to pray more. Sometimes we fast. Sometimes we read the word even more. And we learn to trust more. We learn to be patient. So amidst this suffering, we come out stronger and better. We come out refined, you know? So when we go through the fire and we are not quenched, we come out pure, you know, mm -hmm. like gold through the fire. We come out even more purified, you know? So in most cases, we, 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 are we are being pulled down through a trial, but God tells us that, that we shall be tasted by fire, you know? Uh -huh. We shall be tasted by fire. So he knows that being that he promised us that he shall never let something that we cannot handle come to us. You know, I'm just paraphrasing that scripture somewhere. He, he knows what we can handle and what we cannot handle. And being that he loves us so much, we as parents, we cannot try to have our children carry something that we know they cannot handle. How about God, who is our maker? So by the time he lets something that we see as a hardship, as a trying situation, come even in our range, in our atmosphere, he knows that he has built us to handle this. Even if sometimes we look at ourselves and we think, how am I going to handle this? If we look at our leader, who is the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead us and show us exactly how we can handle this. So yes, the righteous suffer, but it's not only the righteous who are suffering. It's just that we have a backup. When we are suffering, we have a place to hide in the presence of the Most High. We have a place where we find safety. That even if everybody else is suffering, we are walking the same race with everybody else. At the end of the day, our, our finishing line is not going to be the same with everybody else. We're not going to finish like those who know not the Lord. Amen. So I'll I'll just stop. <laughs> I, I could stop. I could talk for a <laughs> Amen. Well, we appreciate that. And we can tell that you have definitely uh, walked, experienced, and know what you're talking about. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And even more so is, you know, Terrence alluded to it earlier. We also see that on continents. And mm -hmm. I had the privilege of, you know, uh, being a missionary to Uganda. And mm -hmm. in doing so, that is one of the things that God has birthed in them mm -hmm. is prayer because of all of the suffering. They went mm -hmm. from Idi Amin to Abate to AIDS and all of that. So that travailing prayer, that, that understanding that God is God no matter what, and to be grateful and to be thankful. But also the understanding is there are portals that we can open that the enemy has every legal right to come into. And so therefore we need to allow the Holy Spirit to identify those things. And then after that, stand in faith and know that God has got it, got it. God is trying in our suffering to birth something out of you. And that something is for you to become more like him. Every day, we are to become Christ-like. Amen. Anyone else? I want to I wanna just add a little more something. See, sometimes, just as you said earlier, Pastor Sylvia, that sometimes we go through situations, but God is actually preparing us for our journeys of ministry. You know, or for, or for the journeys ahead of us, being that he's going to bring more people for us to lead. He's going to make us stewards over more people than that, those we already have. You know, so coming from a background whereby you're struggling to put food on the table, you know, God has taken you through that or us through that or me through that, whereby I have children who are looking at me. They expect me to bring food from the table, but I have no idea where the next meal is going to come from. 
So if we get to a level past that, where there's going to be food every day, where there is assured availability of every meal, and there's just these other bills, we're going to look at those and refer to the God who brought food on the table every day mm -hmm. without a definition. And that is going to be a, refer a place of reference to keep us stronger, to mm. bring us to trust this God even more, to bring us to a point of standing out and saying, I know my God, he is faithful. Mm. I know my God, he is able. I know my God, he can never abandon me. He has not brought me this far to abandon me, to fail me. It builds us stronger and stronger. The trials, the hard times, the sufferings are just building us stronger for the next level. Amen. Amen. We appreciate that. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 And it does give you that, that passion that you have. Amen. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. trusting and believing in the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I wanted to respond to your question, Pastor Sylvia, about whether God does evil. Mm -hmm. And I would say no, because even the evil actions that occur and all of the trials and tribulations, I think are ultimately, they ultimately birth good. They birth strength of character. They birth the um, recognition of God's work and the fact that people can on his strength even when they don't understand why things are the way they are trusting in his greater reason and purpose for humanity so no I, do, I don't think that he does evil I think that the the evil occurs as a lesson for humanity to, for humanity to better understand themselves and their relationship with God and ultimately be more a reflection of God amen amen thank you Anyone else want to add on to that? Yes, please. Um, um, in the course of reading uh, scripture, uh, there are two things that I see that God brings uh, that, I, that I can understand as I read through. I know he doesn't, he doesn't do evil. What he does is he tests and he judges. And if you're without the spirit and, under, and, and without understanding, and you may look at his judgment as evil, uh, but uh, God will always tell us why he's doing what he's doing. Mm. And so I know he brings about your testing and judgment. That's right. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So he tests and he brings forth his righteous judgment. I want to hear from someone we haven't heard from. I know you're out there. What are your thoughts? Come on. I see Sheila go right ahead. Amen. <laughs> um, in, uh, in 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Mm. So he, with an exclamation point, um, has no darkness in him. No evil can be in him. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Now I know yeah. we're at the um, 8, uh, 8.30 timeline, and some of you will have to go. But for those that want to continue <laughs> on in our discussion, we're going to continue on until 9 p.m., I hope that you will stay. Amen. But if you do need to depart, feel free to do so. And we're going to continue on in the same line. And the question again is, can God, does God do evil? Is there evil in God? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I think I'll go in accordance to the book of Job chapter 34 and verse 12. The Bible says that Indeed, it is true that God does not act wickedly and the Almighty does not pervert justice. So through it all, our God will remain a righteous God that is always just. Amen. Thank you. So he does not sin. Amen. I saw an yeah. iPhone that was coming on and you was this unmuted is. and then rebuting. Uh, so if I'm talking to you, iPhone, please come on and respond. There's Terrence. Hello. Terrence has a hand up. Oh, no, no. I heard I, this person right here. I hear you. Go right ahead. Um, no, he doesn't do evil for he is holy and righteous. However, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, um, 
when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, that's when evil, when their eyes were open to evil, that's how it came in. But it was never God's um, intention for us to know evil. Amen. All right. Anyone else want to respond? Blessing here. I would, I would just respond with a scripture that says, um, God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. James 1 13. Amen, Phyllis. That's it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So the answer is absolutely not. Amen. No. There is no evil in God. So anything mm -hmm. that God does, that's what we have to understand. That's why he told us with assurance in Romans 8 and 28, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. Amen. And God's purpose is never for evil. Never. It is always for good because he is good. Amen. He is good. Anyone else before we move on to the next one? Here's the next question you were to be pondering. Can mm -hmm. say I heard someone. I'll just, I'll just add a little bit to that. Uh, it's just an argument. Yes, God can never do evil because he's holy. It's just that um, even when the devil is trying to attack those who already have God's covering, who already have a hedge around them, the devil is going to push them to sin so that he can have a point of contact because he used fear to get through to Job. And even you see in the book of Numbers, when, when King Barak was trying to attack the Israelites, he, he brought the prophet Balaam, but the, the, the Hebrews had just been through a tough time where they were in trouble with God, but they had just done all the repentance they needed. So whatever, Barak wanted Balaam to do, he could not. Because these people were now good with their God. They are free of sin. So even if the devil is trying to attack us, the devil is always going to look for a loophole or push you into sin, be it complaining, be it grumbling, be it anger, even for a teeny, teeny little place, a space, you know, to, to create a gap so as to get through. Because our God is holy. He is holy and that will never change and he will never do wickedness or evil or any abominations. He can never participate in that because he is God and he changes not. Amen. And whatever evil befalls us, some way, somehow, there has been a loophole. There has been a loophole. The devil uses our humanity somehow to, to, to try and compromise us and pull us slightly from the presence of holiness. And that is the only way the devil can access us because wickedness does not exist in the face of God. Amen. And blessing, you made two very good points that I want to expand upon. And first and foremost is, I believe everyone is familiar with that. And that is, um, when they were coming out of Egypt and going through the land of the Moabites. Moabites being led by Moses, then the king of the Moabites saw them and became afraid and concerned. So he went to Balaam, who was a sorcerer. And that's what you need to understand that just because someone says that they hear from God doesn't mean that they are of God. And he could not not bless them. He brought him in to curse them. But there's the interesting thing. He said, who God intends to bless, you cannot curse. And the point is, when we stay in Christ, especially those of us that are believers, Ephesians says over and over again, in Christ, in Christ. It simply means that the enemy has to go through Christ to get to you. Amen. God is showing us in the book of Job 
that Satan said it himself. Have you not put a hedge of protection, a ring of fire around him and everything that's his? The only way that that hedge would go down is because Job gave in to fear instead of trusting God. And that trust is, I don't need to go through the extra measures of every time my children have, he had seven sons. So seven times a year, he was doing those sacrifices on an altar. I know we don't have time to get into the altar, but if you look at it and you go back to Genesis, everywhere Abraham went, he built an altar to the Lord. And the altar is the place where you draw the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. the presence come, then the enemy, the Holy Spirit, pushes back darkness so that his kingdom can come. If Job had a just been focusing on the presence and not the fear of what might happen to his children, because God didn't ask him to do that. God asked him to come to the altar, meet, connect with him, and focus on him. When we entrust what we have to God, God is trustworthy and he will do it. Amen. Amen. The other point I want to make is that, yes, the Bible told us we were going to be tempted. That's Satan's job. But our job is to stand firm and to stay in the position of trusting God. Satan can't make you sin. Amen. You choose that because we know what right is and we choose to do something different. Doesn't mean that, you know, he's not going to do everything he can. Absolutely. But when we stand in Christ and we begin to declare, live and project the word of God, then we don't have to give in to that temptation because what he uses is a temptation is really a test. In Job, it says that God is the one that visits us daily and he tests us moment by moment. Pass the test and you won't fall into temptation. The enemy is not greater than our God. He is not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent, but he can give us thoughts and he can project stimuli so that we can fall for the lie instead of holding and believing in the truth. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, God is God and he is great. Yeah, Amen. Amen. He yeah. fights the battle for us. So God cannot do evil. Amen. And we cannot say the evil that came upon us is a result of God. It's just mm -hmm. not so. And then the last question that I had is, uh, again, can Satan provoke, it's number three, provoke God into doing anything evil? No. no, he can't. No. He can't. That's why when we were going through the book of Job, because we say, and I was taught this and looked at it a lot, that God pointed Satan to Job, Job pointed Job out to Satan, and therefore God said, okay, well, you just go ahead and do whatever. No, God knew because he knows the heart of man. That's what he examines is our heart. And looking at it, because even though the scripture wasn't written, God had brought him into a personal relationship and was educating, teaching him about the things and trying to lay out that he should not fear. But his fear gave the enemy a legitimate ground and authority to come and operate in his life. And God was confirming to Satan what he already knew. You have eyes on Job. You have already set your heart. You've already set yourself. Notice when God said, everything that he has is in your hands. There are consequences for sin. There are consequences for our actions. And again, they open up the portal of darkness. And it is through repentance, it's through seeking God, that God can close those things. Amen. Satan cannot provoke God to do mm -mm. evil against you and I. No. God has a plan and he has a purpose. Amen. And then the last one is, is God like the mafia? He would send Satan. 
I uh, apologize. Courtney had her hand up. I just wanted to see if she oh, had okay. the last question. Go ahead, Courtney. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, before I forgot, I wanted to, to just say I had a side thought. This doesn't go with our questions. Um, but it occurred to me when I was reading Job 9, 33 through 35, Job said, if only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together, the mediator could make God stop feeding me, and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I could not do that in my own strength. And it occurred to me how blessed we are to have a mediator, to have Jesus, to be cleansed by his blood so that we can speak to God and come to him and worship him and pray to him um, and and uh, you know, take our, our sins before him. And only and only through Jesus that we can do that. And then there and, I've, and there are other parallels between Job and Jesus that they were both tempted by Satan. God both allowed Satan to tempt Job, and He also allowed Satan to tempt Jesus. Um, and so I thought that was a really cool uh, thing that just you know God is very symbiotic, and He <laughs> He doesn't do things by accident. So not sure of the complete meaning of that, but that just occurred to me when I was reading, and I wanted to share. Amen. And Courtney, your point is very good. And I think that that's what we should also see as well. And that's what God is trying to show us is that, yes, indeed, we have a mediator. But did you also notice that Job never talked to God? He didn't take his cares and his concerns. He didn't cast them upon the Lord. He mm -hmm. talked at and was demanding God's attention. And if God would show up and talk to him, but did he go to God in prayer? Did he seek the Lord and say, Lord, what is this? What's going on? No, 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 no. He sat with his friends for seven days. And then after that time, he stood and began to curse the day he was born. And he began to accuse God. You know, again, if you, when it says that he did not use his lips to, um, he, did not, he did not speak bad of God or curse God with his lips. It didn't say his mind. And so he had begun to think and his heart had been affected and he began to see God a little differently. But he never humbled himself, amen, until God chastised him. He didn't humble himself and have a direct conversation. You and I are blessed. We can have direct conversations with God and we can lay out a heart before God. We can talk to him and know that our mediator, Jesus Christ, is between us and God. But that's the first place that we want to take it. Amen. Amen. The first place we want to go. God, yes. I don't understand this. And God is not going to be mad. Mm -hmm. That is and so in true. To, I just wanted to. Hold on. Just ahead, blessing. Blessing. We'll come back. Go ahead, Chantel. I, I just wanted to say that that is so beautiful, Pastor Sylvia. And that is so true. I, uh, I my I uh, recently went through a, a trial. Um, my hair started falling out, and I took it to the Lord first. I went to Him first in my prayer closet, and I said, "I don't understand this. I I, I need help. So just give me strength to go through it." And then I was actually scared to take a shower. And then I went back and I came out, went back into my prayer closet and said, you be my hands and wash my hair. Mm -hmm. You be my hands and wash my hair. And I love you. I love you. And I don't know why, but I love you and, and just help me. And when I got in the shower, as I saw the clumps coming out, Jesus said to me, keep your eyes on me. So he does fight for us and mm -hmm. he will speak mm -hmm. to us. So I just wanted to share that. I, oh, I yeah. love how personal he is, but taking it to him first is just the ultimate compliment to our Lord and Savior. Amen. Yeah. And, and you just said it personal, personal relationship. And he responds he responds. Do you ever look at the book of Job and wonder why it took so many chapters for God to show up? 
because he wasn't talking to him. He was talking about him, but he didn't address it. And it wasn't until the last individual who was filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to speak forth the things of the Spirit. And the Spirit drew the Spirit of God, and God shows up. Amen. Because they were in self. Job relationship with God. That's why when I showed you that in uh, Genesis chapter uh, six and nine, it says that Noah walked with God. Does not say that about Job. And we begin to defend Job and say Job was did, 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 did. What else was God trying to let us see? See, there's a difference between I know you then I walk with you. I have a relationship. May I chime in on that? Yes, please. That was something that kind of also stood out to me was that, you know, Job was claiming um, innocence. And it really mm. does seem to conflict with biblical teaching, you know, that we see where the New Testament tells us no one is righteous, not mm. even one. You know, but the Lord called him a blameless man. You know, it says all fall short of God's glorious standard. So, you know, was Job right in proclaiming his innocence, I think, is a question. Because um, when we see his uh, friends, Eliphaz and the others, they were basically saying that Job couldn't be right or, or pure. This is why they were so adamant. They were... But I, they were referring um, to the absolute difference between the creature and the creator, you know, and Job, I don't think he was actually claiming absolute purity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for us to acknowledge because he acknowledged um, in Job uh, chapter 13, he acknowledged his youth, youthful sins. So he's not saying that he was without sin. And he was even aware of his need to have his sins, um, his guilt covered. We see that in the book of Job but in chapters 14, um, I think verse 16 and 17. And, um, you know, Job repeatedly claimed uh, to be a man of integrity and innocence in his relationship with God. That's where he was saying, I think he was innocent in his relationship with God because even Eliph Eliphaz, however you say that name, acknowledged that um, Job's life um, was upright. You know, Job kept talking about looking for a redeemer. And on that basis, God actually was declaring Job blameless, a man of complete integrity because God, you know, he, he, he had faith and God does the same for us when we, like Job, put our complete trust in him. That's the reason I believe that he was referred to as blameless, you know, before God, because it's like the faith of Abraham. And I think that's something really good for us to grasp while we're in this book of Job, you know, not getting confused with him being called a righteous man. Because we know that not one is righteous. Mm -hmm. The reason he was accounted for as righteousness is the same reason that Abraham was. And the same reason that we are is because we see Job had faith. Job was trusting God. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that just stood out to me. And I just wanted to, to share that. No, I appreciate that. I think we all do. And that's the thing that I was trying to say is that, again, when God is talking about that he's blameless, he's not saying he's with, he's perfect, that he's without error, that he has done no wrong. That's not what he means. He is simply saying that as far as his integrity, his heart and doing the right thing. But what happened to Job is what can happen to any of us when things begin to go wrong, we begin to recall all that we have done for God as if God owes us. And he doesn't. Amen. He does not. And begin to boast in ourselves instead of boasting in our God. In the times of our struggle, in the times of, you know, the suffering, that's when we need to pull back and remember, God did this for me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I am a sinner saved by grace. Blessed be his name. Amen. Job started well, and many of the statements he said are profound. But again, when we look at the story that could have been of any person in humanity, 
when things began to go on and round after round, because that's what it was. It was a fighting match with his friends. Then he began to step to be feel, think and say some things that were not as complimentary and uplifting to God as perhaps they should have been. He said, I've not done anything wrong. God has done wrong to me. Glory be unto God. But God again showed his great mercy in that when Job repents, God says he's done nothing wrong. That's the same thing he does with you and I. Amen. Amen. Um, can I say something? Yes. Yeah, um, I really appreciate um, what you both just spoke about. Because when we look at Job, I basically would want to bring Job to our present day life, to us. You know, if we were living or standing in Job's shoes, Job had been offering sacrifices to God, just like many of us. We, we, we help other people. We pray and intercede on other people's behalf. We fast, we give, we read the Bible. We do a lot of things for the kingdom, you know, but we can never be entitled. We should not Amen. ever let ourselves feel entitled, you know, because we, we do everything that we do by grace by the help of the Holy Spirit. We are not lending, or we, we are not giving God something and expecting or mandating him to pay back to us. Everything that we get from him is by grace. That we should just let ourselves at, at some points be vulnerable before God. If we do not, if you cannot make sense of a situation, let's just go before him and say, God, I don't understand what is going on, but have mercy upon me. But I need you. I need your help. I need clarity with this. How do I pray about this? How do I handle this? You know, but we can never be entitled because we are saved by grace. There are many people out there who are looking for answers in the wrong places. Amen. But Amen. God chose us. We did not earn it. He just chose us. He just had mercy upon us and saved us and revealed his word to us. A lot of people know the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. They know every scripture by offhand, but they have no revelation of it. So God giving us revelation of his word, God giving us his spirit, God bringing us this far is all by grace. We can never feel entitled. And this should always be our prayer that we should never, ever get to a point of feeling entitlement before God, that we should always go before God in, in a humble way, just expecting, highly expecting mercy from him. That if we don't understand anything, we're just telling God, I can't make sense of this, you know? Amen. Because just as uh, Pastor Sylvia said earlier on that, Job thought, he, he never went before God inquiring of what was going on. But at some point he was blaming God. You know, we, this, this happens to a lot of us, sometimes unknowingly. We get into a situation and we are thinking, but God, I've served you. How could you let this happen to me? How could, how could I be at this point? I've given my money in ministry. How could I be lacking right now? You know, so if we get to a point like that, let's just run back to his grace. Let's Amen. just run back and let us be vulnerable before him. Before we cry in the presence of man, let's go and cry before God. Amen. And find for, and try to find answers before him, before we run to find answers before men. Amen. Now, bless yes, I want to expand on a few things that you just said. Amen. As we mm -hmm. are closing in and uh, on the, our time of sharing on tonight. And um, one of the things that you said is uh, again, that um, we need to, understand and operate in a personal relationship, being able to communicate and talk to God. Amen. Uh, many have been taught that if you ask God anything, it's a sin. Amen. It's a sin. 
And I say that because, you know, having been with a recent one who lost her husband and over and over again, people said, don't ask God, why? How come? That's a sin. See, I don't, I don't believe that's true. I believe that in a relationship that we can share our hearts with God and we can seek God for answers. Amen. And God is not going to, you know, uh, curse you and you die. It just is not anything that I see. I don't see it in the scripture. God is looking for us when we find ourselves. Now, he didn't have to answer you because if you notice, he didn't answer Job, but he directed Job into the place and the position where he could find clarity and be able to understand and know who God was. It is a two-way conversation. We speak, we talk, we listen, we seek him, and God will respond. God will respond. And God loves us, and he loves engaging in conversations and being a part of our lives. Amen. Anyone else? Anything else? I would like to share um, just a closing comment. Amanda, well. I saw you. We'll come to you in just a second. Okay. Um, what, another thing I think is important is that um, in this book of Job, you know, we see that counselors can also mislead us mm -hmm. even when their theology is right. Mm -hmm. you know, because as we're reading the book of Job, we can see that Job's counselors were wrong in their accusations against him, but we really cannot just reject their words because much of what they said was correct teaching about God's nature and about his ways of working with human beings. And, you know, Job's friends, what they did wrong was they misapplied the principle of reaping and sowing. They didn't look at Job's life and point out where he had sown evil and then threatened divine judgment. Instead, mm -hmm. they ignored, you know, Job's faithful pattern of his life. And then they focused on his torment, concluding, you know, that he must be reaping the effects of sin. And God eventually called those counselors liars. So that should remind us that right theology must also be rightly applied in order to please God and build up others. And so the, the last thing I just want to say to that is that I think it's good to weigh advice from various sources. You know, the Bible mm -hmm. tells us there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel, but we need to compare the counsel that others give us with what we believe to be right before God. You know, because God might use human counselors to help define his will, but God himself guides us. And Jesus said he is our wonderful counselor. And so we're also told in the word that we need to be led by God's spirit. Romans 8, 14 says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So amen. 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 And there's one thing I always like to say is that is he who holds your ear will hold your destiny. So make sure that the ones that are speaking into you are speaking from God. Amen. Uh, I saw Amanda first and then Jessica, we're going to come to you as we get ready to close it out. Amen. So you're, are you supposed to pray out loud when you pray? Because I've always just prayed in my head. Um, Amanda, I'm going to answer that because, you know, um, again, when we search the scripture and we can see that there is a pattern and a principle, then that's how God does things. I have been places where literally they said that if you do not pray out loud, then it's not a prayer. Well, I don't agree with that. God knows every thought before we think it. Amen. Now, is praying out loud good? Absolutely. I practice it all the time. But there are times when I'm on an airplane for 16 hours. I don't think that they want me screaming. They might turn the plane around and throw me off. Amen. But for those 16 hours, I am in contact with God and I'm praying. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. He knows every thought before you think it. And if there's someone in a hospital bed, but they still have cognitive thought, but they can't speak, does that mean that God is not hearing them? Mm -mm. 
I think that sometimes we can make some absolutes that are not absolute. Amen. Sometimes I can't say anything, but think Jesus, Jesus, and God hears it and break that thing off. I'm not going to get into spiritual warfare, but those of you who are know a little bit about that, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -mm, you can't get anything out. But I'm telling you, God responds and he will break that thing off of you. Glory be unto God. Jessica, I hope that answered your prayer of your question, Amanda. Uh, Amanda. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Actually, it's Barbara. That's my daughter's name on my computer. I don't know why. Okay. Um, well, mother I, of Jessica, go right ahead. I know, it's Barbara. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment on Krista's uh, comment, actually, because I thank you, Krista, for that, because I, I think that was one of the hardest uh, things for me understanding this book, because I'm like, what they're saying is right. Like, everything sounds right, but why is it not right? I always kind of had that um, misunderstanding, and you just literally answered that that just kind of clicked everything into place so thank you for that because i was like but it's right counseling because it's the truth but then that doesn't mean it's always right it can become it even come from a good place but it doesn't always mean that our counselors are are completely right or accurate so um that's why i think the relationship with god is is so important because the holy spirit will reveal that to us too um, but yeah, so that was just all I wanted to say. Thank you. Amen. You know, and that's what I think is so awesome about everyone participating in this, because this is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. We all have something to offer one another, you know, through whatever the Lord has in our hearts. Even our questions are helpful to one another in, in this sort of format. So glory be to God, because truly, I believe that we're, we're growing together in him as we meet in fellowship like this. Amen. 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 Well, well, we're at the Chris, top of the hour, Pastor Sylvia. Did yes, you? we are. I want to make one last comment and then we're going to be done. And that is, again, you can have all the right answers, but if your heart is not right, they forgot compassion. And God is the God of compassion. Amen. And he wants us. That's why he says that uh, love covers a multitude of sins. So if Job's friends were correct and Job had did wrong, then bring the correction, but do so in love. Love, 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 love. Because that's what God does. Amen. It has been wonderful joining you all. I apologize for how it started. You know, I practiced this thing, but whatever. But I was going to keep it moving and keep it going. So as we say in our religious settings, you all pray for me and I'll pray for you. Amen. Amen. Krista, I'll turn it back over to you. Amen. And so, yes, we are going to close now and we want to invite you back Mondays. We meet every single Monday. So if you don't get a notification, you just come to the website touroftruth.com and click on the link to get in here. We will look forward to seeing you again next week. And um, I know you turned it back over to me, but I opened it in prayer. So I think uh, maybe you should close us out in prayer or choose someone to close us out in prayer. Is there anyone Who's feeling uh, led to pray for our meeting, our closure here? Amen. Well, I didn't see any hands, so I'll be more than happy to. Amen. And if you need to get off before I finish praying, God won't be mad at you. It's amen. I will do my best to keep it within, uh, you know. I'll keep it short. Okay, glory to God. But I want you all to participate in our closing out in prayer. Can you just begin to speak well of God? Amen. Open up your mouths if that is possible. If not, then think well of God and speak well of him. Tell him how wonderful, how marvelous, how great. Tell him how much you appreciate him being your Lord, your God, that he met us here because he said if two or more joined together, they're in the midst of he. Can you just open up your heart and allow it to flow? Because God so loved us that he gave us the story of Job to display humanity in all of its element. Glory and honor, blessed be your name. Father, we thank you because most importantly, you showed up on tonight and you loved each 
one of us to draw us here so that we can get fresh revelation, fresh understanding, and that we could know that no matter what it is, you are God. And that, yes, the righteous suffer, but we don't suffer alone because we suffer with you. You cannot do evil, you never will. And that Satan cannot provoke you into doing evil, but you have given certain grounds and authority, so you allow him to operate in that. But if he, like those who mistreated your children by the hands of enemy, you would step in and you would do something about it. And it's the same way it is with us. Blessed be your name. And God, you are not a mafia man. You are the Lord, our God. And if you do something, you let us know that you did it. And then you begin to soothe and comfort. So we thank you on tonight that the God of comfort is the one that comforts us, the one that loves us, the one that decided that you did not want to leave us the way that we were. So you opening up our eyes of understanding so that we might be enlightened. And as Paul prayed, that we may know the height, the width, the depth, and the length of the love of you, Jesus Christ. May your love overflow in each one of us as we stay on this path, receiving the bread of life, because you are the bread of life that you give us, that you feed us every single day. And you receive all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, I pray that everyone that came, all that they have poured out, you will fill them up again, and their cups overflow. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. 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 God bless you all. We'll see amen. you next week. Amen.